Society. Is that? Oh, yes, sir. I'm the president of the society. And uh, for those of you who don't know our society very well, it's a scholarly home for the for those interested in scholarship and the writing and the history of Navy and maritime medicine. We're about 170 members strong, and our mission is to support research, scholarship, and publication in the history of all aspects of the history of Navy and maritime medicine and to promote knowledge of the history to the general, general public. We have three excellent uh, presentations for you this afternoon. And that will be followed by a our commentator, Paulo Schiapacase. Schiapacase. Paulo, are you, Paula, are you on the line? Yes, I'm here. Good afternoon. Was my pronunciation of your name anywhere near correct? It's almost perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Paula will be the commentator at the end of our three presentations, and uh, and we will have a, a short Q and A session, I think, at the end of, of each session. Uh, the uh, panelists that we have all have very extensive CVs. Uh, they're all very experienced, and I think you will uh, enjoy their talks. I, I, like all of you, are looking forward to learning more about Navy medicine this afternoon. Uh, so I'm going to keep all of the introductions short so that the speakers have the maximum amount of time um, to, to talk and then for questions afterwards. Our first speaker, as you can see by your program, is Captain Medical Corps Navy retired Gerald Stolk, who is uh, uh, speaking to us today personally. He's here in the room. Uh, Dr. Stolk obtained his uh, MD degree at the University of Iowa, completed his general surgery residency at Georgetown University and fellowships in transplant surgery at Loyola and cancer surgery at Roswell Park. Uh, he was a clinical assistant professor of surgery at the University of Louisville. And he's very active in writing. He's written for surgical journals, uh, as well as uh, writing fiction. Uh, published a historical nonfiction, historical fiction novel, The Surgeon's Mate, and he is completing a nonfiction biography and working on a comprehensive history of military medicine. And I believe that's going to be entitled The Red Badge. Is that right? right. Okay. Uh, most important to me, he, as I already have mentioned, is a retired uh, naval aviator, uh, retired from the Navy Reserve. And equally important, he is, associate, he is a member of the Association of Military Surgeons of the United States, AMSIS, of which I was the executive director for about eight years, a number of years ago. So without further ado, I will introduce Dr. Gerald Stone. Thank you. Thank you, Admiral Sanford. Also a proud member of the 1805 Club. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Thank you, Admiral Sanford, for the introduction. Fellow attendees, and I wish to thank the Naval Academy again for the privilege and honor of our small medical group here to be able to speak to you at this uh, uh, prestigious symposium. Uh, it seems like we always get relegated to the end here as medical providers for the armed forces. <clears throat> I'm going to be speaking on the history of scurvy, the toll on the Georgian Royal Navy and the impediments uh, to its uh, treatment and cure. In 1740, oh, okay, okay. when you get a chance, in 1740, Commodore Anson sailed with eight ships of his West Africa squadron to South America and the Pacific on a mission to disrupt Spanish naval operations. Anson made it back four years later after completing a circumnavigation of the world, the crew having, meanwhile, undergone a steady attrition due to typhus, malaria, and dysentery. However, the real toll of men occurred as the remaining ships about three out of those eight ships 
across the Pacific, scurvy ravaging the crew of the original 1,854 men, 188 came back. Scurvy, as you well know, is a deficiency of vitamin C. It has an infamous legacy as a prevalent illness among navies in the past, but it is generally underestimated and underappreciated as to how inimical the disease was historically to the health and operations of the major navies at that time. We simply don't see scurvy anymore. I never saw a case as a physician and surgeon. Its effects, however, were well documented during the 16th through the 19th centuries. The Georgian Royal Navy, for instance, anticipated a mortality rate of up to 50% of its crews during extended voyages or blockades lasting more than six weeks. It has been stated that arguably over 2 million sailors died of the disease over the first three centuries of the Royal Navy, 1 million in the 18th century alone, and 5 million sailors worldwide. Naval surgeon James Lind of scurvy fame with lemons concluded in 1753 that scurvy had caused more deaths in the British Navy than all the French and Spanish arms combined. Now, the incidence of scurvy known on land well before his descriptions of it by Hippocrates and Pliny and others increased dramatically during the age of sail and discovery as longer voyages became more practicable due to advances in shipbuilding technology, cartography, and navigation. The odious physical signs and symptoms that I'll be happy to show you as soon as we can upload the slides <laughs> were such as to make scurvy a pejorative adjective in everyday language and literature. Everyone with a bad impression of a pirate will use scurvy. It came to be applied to something or someone as being mischievous, vile, low, and vulgar, worthless and shabby, contemptible, even malicious. The term scurvy or scurfy was used at least since the late 15th century, meaning to be covered or afflicted with scurf, with scabs. And it was derived either from the French scorbut or the Dutch chabot. The term used as a noun or adjective was Latinized in the 1650s as scorbuticus, pertaining to scurvy. And therefore, by the 18th century, any treatment for it was an anti-scorbutic. Now, virtually all explorers and adventurers from the 14th into the late 19th century, and even with the Scott expedition to Antarctica in the early 20th century, encountered scurvy to varying degrees. Scurvy afflicted Columbus on his second voyage, wiping out his first uh, establishment settlement in the New World. Vasco de Gama, Diaz, Magellan, Francis Drake, etc., etc., all had to deal with scurvy. By 1780, scurvy among Admiral Francis Geary's Channel Fleet hospitalized many men, forcing him to port with 2,400 ill men, one in seven of his fleet, most of them from scurvy. Thomas Trotter, a Scottish naval physician, wrote in 1803, quote, it was no uncommon thing in those times, 1780s, for a ship during an eight weeks cruise to bury 10 or 12 men in scurvy and land 50 at an hospital. However, the cause for scurvy remained enigmatic. Though numerous ingenious but spurious etiologies were proffered by physicians and others, the disease was various, variously attributed to heredity, mood, melancholia, infection, fouled and humid sea air, the inhibition of perspiration below decks to get rid of toxins in the body, the ingestion of salt water or salted meats that are prevalent in the diets of sailors, and the lack of proper acidity of the blood due to the type of diet given, also lack of exercise or a yearning to be back on land as a psychosomatic. Thing. Yet at the turn of the 20th century, prominent physicians and scientists still held 
the several of these theories of scurvy. It wasn't until 1912 that vitamin C was discovered, called the scorbic acid. In 1932, within the lifetime of my parents, that the connection between vitamin C and scurvy was finally made. Now, there are diverse signs and symptoms with the illness, beginning, as James Lynn described, a pale and bloated complexion with a listlessness to action or an aversion to any sort of exercise. In other words, these people were deathly fatigued and weak. Progressive fatigue and muscle weakness with myalgias and bone aches then occurred, and typical lesions began to form on the legs and on the lower trunk, flat purplish spots that led to breakdown of the overlying skin, resulting in open putrid and foul-smelling ulcers that were difficult to heal. These signs were accompanied by hair loss, a corkscrew appearance to the hair, which is typical of it, and bleeding from the hair follicles. Old wounds and fractures were prone to come apart no matter how long ago incurred. Perhaps one of the most unpleasant complications is the swelling, the sponginess and bleeding of the gums accompanied by a putrid sort of halitosis and by the loosening and loss of teeth. Admiral Nelson, when he went in 1782 to the Americas, lost a great many of his teeth due to scurvy. Lady Anson, the wife of the Commodore that I spoke of at the beginning, wrote of a visit her husband, now Admiral Anson, received from Captain Rodney and two or three of the captains returned from Louisburg, whose company was so offensive from the state of their health, meaning their bad breath, as to make it just possible to bear the cabin with them or even almost after they were gone. Now, this also suggests that not only officers who had better diets were supposed to be in better health overall, suffered as well from scurvy, but continued to serve on active duty. It could be a chronic stable disease, though it would derail several promising careers. One captain actually requested shore duty instead of being um, a uh, at sea captain because he couldn't endure scurvy at sea. In severe scurvy, the final stages where the weakness and muscle fatigue become pronounced, mental aberrations occur, such as depression, hallucinations, and without proper therapy, coma, and death can ensue. Though far more people become chronically ill and debilitated from scurvy than die from it. Now, from the high Middle Ages, sailors and navies were acquainted with fresh vegetables and fruit consumption as antiscorbutics. The sailors knew this. They would grab fresh fruits whenever they could get on shore. But the preservation of these goods also became problematic as progressively longer sea voyages were undertaken. John Woodall, a military surgeon who served the East India Company in the early 17th century, suggested preventative therapies for the horror of scurvy in the surgeon's mate, and he had a great deal of citrus fruits. The Portuguese and Dutch actually planted vegetables and fruit trees in St. Helena to be used by homebound ships on their return from Asia with scorbutic sailors. Throughout the 17th and 18th centuries, numerous naval surgeons wrote of the antiscorbutic value of fresh fruits and vegetables. However, the repeated observations of the efficacy of citrus were observed, forgotten, learned again, only to be dismissed again. Therapies promoted for scurvy at the time included beer, reasonable, malt of wort, a uh, type of plant called scurvy grass, vegetable acids, fresh meats, soups of onion and garlic, Peruvian bark, quinine, along with purging, laxatives, and of course, age-old blood letting. In the 17th century, the naval admiralty added beer to a sailor's daily ration, up to four pints a day per sailor. Sounds pretty good. Believing it to be inexpensive and salutary. In 1747, James Lind, 
as a naval surgeon, uh, undertook what has been described as the first clinical trial in history in his attempt to determine the causes and treatments of scurvy. He took 12 scorbutic sailors on a ship Salisbury, and they were divided into six groups, two each, each group receiving exactly the same diet, but with one dietary variable. And I won't get into the details, but one of this group received the citrus fruits, lemons, and oranges. They had to stop the trial at the end of six days because the lemons and oranges ran out. However, those two people were already cured of their scurvy. Yet the other five groups continued to remain severely scorbutic. Lind published his book. You can bring up anytime you want. Uh, sir. Okay. Lind published this treatise on scurvy in 1753, six years after this experiment. The book, though read by many physicians, made little impact on the management of scurvy, and even less so on the admiralty. The admiralty continued to endorse the use of beer and wort malt, and many physicians saw Lynn's clinical experiment as merely anecdotal, without much definitive conclusion. Nevertheless, in 1756, the Admiralty directed the Vittling Board to issue fresh vegetables and meat to all ships in port. But the difficulty was in provisioning the ships on distant voyages and in sustaining long duration blockades. And Corey spoke to that very nicely in the last session about provisioning. The novel concept of replenishment at sea, attempted on Anson's disastrous voyage that I started out with, was met, therefore, with enormous logistical difficulties. Consequently, on a second voyage to the Pacific in 1772, Captain James Cook was given close to 8,000 pounds of sauerkraut. Over two years at sea, Cook reported that no one died of scurvy. But the sauerkraut was notoriously disliked by the sailors, leading to compliance problems. They wouldn't touch the stuff. However, on his return to England, Cook instead attributed the antiscorbutic effects to sweet wort of malt, endorsing it as the preferred antiscorbutic. And despite these various implementations by the Admiralty, there are still over 5,000 cases admitted in 1780 to Hasler Hospital alone, 5,000 cases in one year. Historians have made much of the tardiness and the negligence on the part of the Admiralty in their failure to prevent and treat scurvy among its fleets. The Admiralty, however, saw their mission strictly as the military conduct of war. They did not bother themselves with anything other than that, relying on the sick and hurt board and the vittling boards for recommendations concerning the health and diet of seamen. As such, it was also vulnerable to the influences of esteemed officers like James Cook, the opinions of self-promoting physicians, and of charlatans promising affordable panaceas for the ills affecting the Navy. Importantly, Cook's perplexing conclusion regarding malt as an anti-scorbutic rather than the sauerkraut, which does have a high content of vitamin C, held great sway with the Admiralty because of his prestige at this time. Lynn's study in 1747 was dismissed by Cook, basing his own conclusions on political agendas. Moreover, the Vittling Board, responsible for provisioning naval forces, always kept a sharp eye on their budget and expenditures and was not exempt from the occasional fraud. The sick and hurt board, in turn, was compromised, comprised, and compromised by commissioners who were primarily civilian. These men were making medical decisions. Right, sir. Yeah, just keep on going. Those are the gingival gums. That's Admiral Nelson, timeline, etymology, blah, blah, blah. And that, that, treatise of scurvy, the signs, and some sauerkraut. Now you can back up to the Admiralty. Okay, so. Uh, physicians were not placed on the board until the late 18th century. Otherwise, civilians were making medical decisions with absolutely no training 
or knowledge of what they were deciding. And this was with the appointment, if you can give me the next slide or two, next slide please, and next slide, of uh, Gilbert Blaine, a Scottish physician, who was the first physician to be commissioner of the Sick and Hurt Board in 1795. And another fleet physician next to him, black and white, is Thomas Trotter, another Scottish surgeon who uh, distributed citrus juice to ships devastated by scurvy during the extended blockade of Brest in 1793. And this pretty much wiped out scurvy in that channel blockade. So by 1796, Blaine and Trotter successfully convinced the Admiralty for service-wide distribution of lemon juice. This was two years after Lynn's death and 43 years after the publication of his book. Still, Blaine and Trotter were egotistical, very hard to get along with, absolutely convinced of the righteousness of their views. And this also became a sticking point in trying to deal with the more delicate political maneuverings with the Admiralty. Nevertheless, the benefits of lemon juice were immediately noted. Hassler Hospital recorded that the number of scurvy cases fell from 329,000 in 1782 to 20,000 by 1799. And at the end of the Napoleonic Wars in 1815, scurvy had, quote, almost disappeared from the fleet. The number of cases reduced to single digits from 329,000 to single digits. Well, there's a flying ointment. Recently, the legacy of Lynn's vaunted experiments have come under major reevaluation. Can you back up a couple of slides, please? That's the one. Yeah. And uh, several uh, prominent naval historians recently have written articles saying that, first of all, Lynn did little to promote the results of his clinical trial. In fact, it comprises four pages of over 300 pages in his book on, on the treatise of scurvy. So he just sort of glances through it, never comes to any definitive conclusions. In fact, the ship's captain and the lieutenant never even made mention of Lynn's experiment on their boat in their daily ship logs. Furthermore, Lynn vacillated throughout his treatise on therapies still giving precedence to his own particular popular theory of internal putrefaction, internal rotting of the body uh, because of improper acid diet, a uh, convoluted theory that has absolutely no merit. When Lind was appointed chief physician of the Naval Hospital at Hassler 10 years later, he was charged with attending to three to 400 scorbutic cases a day. He wrote that every medicine or method of cure that could be suffered was tried out for the relief of the distress or the scorbutics. So even after he had done this clinical trial, he's still experimenting, even though the data was staring him in the face, he was still experimenting to the end of his life with different kinds of theories and cures for scurvy. Now, I just want to give you, if you can have the next slide, please, to explain to you just why scurvy has this horrible effect of deficiency of vitamin C on the human body. Uh, vitamins are synthesized by the body or acquired in the diet and are critical to initiating normal biochemical processes. They ignite, they turn on enzymes that then can rush through the biochemical processes that are conducive to life within our bodies. This is ongoing as we're all sitting here, just hundreds of thousands of biochemical reactions going on, all facilitated by the vitamins in our diets. Now, Vitamin C is synthesized by almost all animals, except bats, guinea pigs, and you and me. We have to get our vitamin C from our diets. We can't synthesize it. Vitamin C is involved in the maintenance of immunity, growth and repair of tissues, the production of neurotransmitters, the chemicals that allow normal nerve conduction. It's also necessary for the body synthesis of carnitine, now, carnitine is a chemical that helps bring energy 
inside of the muscle cells. Consequently, if you don't have vitamin C to produce the carnitin, you have severe muscle weakness and pain. That's where that comes from. The major function of ascorbic acid vitamin C, however, is the synthesis of collagen. Collagen is a fibrous protein in our body that constitutes about 25 to 30 percent of our body proteins. It's sort of the rebar in steel. It's the support structure of all our organs, blood vessels. It forms bones, ligaments, tendons, hair, our very nails, and maintains our skin and scars. Gum sponginess and skin bruising is due to increased fragility of the small blood vessels due to loss of collagen, loss of teeth, skin ulcerations, poor wound healing, abnormal health growth, all attributed to loss of vitamin C and collagen production. Lack of vitamin C also causes degradation of blood clotting factors that lead to the bleeding, resulting in easy bruising and bleeding of the gums. And due to lack of neurotransmitters, we form the psychological disorders, coma, and subsequently death. And because scars and bone fractures are living tissues, they're not dead tissues, they are constantly being turned over. If the collagen isn't produced over time, all our scars pop open again. All our fractures come back. So, in conclusion, with that happy thought, <laughs> uh, last slide, please. The contemporaneous documentation is more than sufficient to conclude that scurvy was a serious and prevalent illness among both shipboard and onshore seamen, significantly affecting the operation and efficiency of not only the Georgian Navy, but most major navies of its day. Scurvy caused severe debility, but not as many deaths, though we'll never know for sure the exact number of deaths that were incurred from scurvy. The etiology due to the lack of medical knowledge, medical science of the time, could not come up with a sufficient etiology cause of scurvy, therefore impeding certainly uh, understanding of a cure. It's like we're dealing now with schizophrenia or Alzheimer's disease. If anyone can give me the cause, either of those, send you my email, and I promise you I will share the Nobel Prize with you. <laughs> there are many different symptoms attending scurvy that could be then also mixed up with other dietary deficiencies that these poor sailors would be suffering from. So there are numerous theories, numerous therapies, none of which were true. There are biases among different physicians. The Admiralty, the Admiralty had its own priorities on conducting war relegating the health care and the diet to people many times who were civilians on these boards that had no prior knowledge or experience of what they were doing. And the uh, biases of influential leaders like James Cook, clashes of personalities, and lastly the vacillation of James Lynn in what could have been a turning point truly remarkable in turning around scurvy and yet even despite the data in front of his own eyes, he relegated it into obscurity. So thank God we have a cure for it and an understanding of it. And uh, thank you for your kind attention. We have a couple of minutes for questions, Q&A, questions? Uh, we leave that till, uh, towards the end. Sorry. Oh, you got to do that? Yeah, OK. We'll do all of that at the end before uh, I'll uh, speak. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Stone, for that fascinating presentation. Uh, and I think we all agree we're all learning something today. I hope so. Something you can really sink your teeth into. It's, <laughs> so, yes, yeah. <laughs> it's a little bitter. But, uh, yeah. All right. Well, our next presentation. Is, uh, uh, is, a, is a double, uh, Jonathan Thayer and Stefan Dreisbach Williams. I, we did have them both up there a little while ago. Uh, Jonathan Thayer is a, uh, a PhD from uh, Graduate Center, City University of New York. He originally did some training at the University College 
Cork, Ireland, got his bachelor's from Wesleyan University in English in uh, 2008, subsequently a master's degree, City University in New York, in the Graduate School of Library and Information Studies, and then his PhD in history from CUNY uh, in a major field of U.S. history, and his dissertation on merchant seamen, sailor towns, and the parameters of U.S. citizenship. He is presently, holds many academic positions, but presently is assistant professor in the Graduate School of Library and Information Studies, Queens College, uh, New York. Jonathan, or Stefan, excuse me, Stefan Reisbach Williams was educated at his bachelor's degree in theater arts from Earlham College in Richmond, Indiana, and his master's in theater education at Emerson College in Boston. Uh, he is now doing, again, many, many different things, but uh, he is a history and theater teacher at Northern Hall School in Sandwich, Massachusetts. A wide variety of experiences in maritime museum work and various projects, and as a tour guide as well. So I would like to uh, present them now to you. Their topic is early innovations in maritime telemedical services. The Siemens Church Institute of New York KDKF Radio Medico Station. So could we have Dr. Thayer? Does Dr. Thayer want to lead off here? Sure, yes. Thanks very much, Admiral. Thanks to Tom. Thanks to Paola uh, for hosting us. So we're happy to be here and I'm going to share my screen. Uh, let's see. One moment. So Stefan and I um, are going to co-present. So we're going to hand off to one each other, uh, to each other, uh, during the course of reading our paper. Uh, mm -hmm. Stefan and I both also work in the archives department of the Siemens Church Institute uh, on a part-time basis, and so we are here to talk about uh, KDKF Radio Medico, um, which was an early innovation for the Siemens Church Institute of New York, um, and. So we've practiced this, I promise. And so we're going to start out with uh, with Stefan. So Stefan, whenever you're ready. Thank you, John. Man put his tongue against refrigerator pipe and got it frozen. Have thawed it out and it is now blistered and swollen, but not painful. Arriving Honolulu Friday. How can I help him meanwhile? Thus read a less than urgent message relayed via radiogram across the ocean to the physician stationed at the Siemens Church Institute's KDKF radio station. Established by the Institute in 1920 on top of its 13-story Seafarer Services Center at the southern tip of Manhattan. The radio was in its infancy. Radio tele telegraphy had already proven its re revolutionary power, featuring prominently in far more serious maritime emergencies, such as the sinking of Titanic. SCI's KDKF radio station aimed to address a less dramatic but no less important problem in blue water navigation, that being access to medical care. The extreme conditions of isolation under which seafarers work and live has prompted a long timeline of changes in information and communication technologies related to seafarer services, including medical care. SCI, which has worked, to, Siemens Church Institute, that is, which has worked to improve conditions for seafarers since 1843, developed and operated KDKF Radio Medico as an unequivocal innovation in maritime medicine that continues to influence efforts to address seafarers' health and safety needs today. Drawing on records in SCI's extensive digital and physical archives, this paper identifies the factors that led SCI to develop this early example of maritime telemedical services and documents its implementation. The case study of the Siemens Church Institute's KDKF radio medical station not only provides insights into early innovations in maritime telemedical services, it is also situated within a larger timeline of initiatives and motivations tied to the foundations of United States maritime reform and navalism. 
Specifically, KDKF and other maritime health and wellness initiatives of its era can be thought of as linked to the doctrine of flexible maritime capacity, which maintained that a stable and healthy citizen merchant marine was essential to national security interests by providing an auxiliary to the military in times of war and imperial expansion. Flexible capacity derived from Mahan's The Influence of Sea Power Upon History. Mahan himself was a, a board member of Siemens Church Institute and was endowed with greater um, urgency by imperial projects embedded in the Spanish-American War and later the First and Second World Wars. Founded in 1834 and still in operation today, the Siemens Church Institute of New York in New Jersey is dedicated to improving the welfare of merchant seafarers both aboard and ashore. Uh, early initiatives in the 19th century involved bringing religious services closer to mariners with floating churches and reading rooms along the waterfront of Lower Manhattan. These served as outposts for temperance campaigns and efforts to combat coercive hiring practices. In 1913, SCI centralized its operations to a 13-story Mariner Services headquarters at 25 South Street on Coenti Slip, where canal boats and steamers from inland waterways moored beside ocean-going freighters just a few blocks from the Staten Island Ferry. 25 South Street offered mariners cheap rooms in a cafeteria, employment services, tailor and barber shops, a chapel, a soda fountain, and more. In 1925, SCI established a medical clinic on the mezzanine of 25 South Street, staffed by members of the Public Health Service. Ear, nose, throat, dental, and eye clinics followed, and by 1931, 25 South Street had supplemented the religious and philanthropic foundations of its mission to serve as a sort of unofficial auxiliary to the U.S. government by providing services to maintain the health and preparedness of the nation's merchant maritime labor force. Following the market crash of 1929, the federal government enlisted private charities like SCI to provide economic relief allocating funds to the Institute to be distributed to destitute seamen who were clogging port cities, boarding houses and relief houses alike during the years of the Great Depression. The Maritime Ministry project that SCI administered during the 1930s served a nationalist economic role in stabilizing an urban labor force that was experiencing the shockwaves of unemployment and that was being recruited into an increasingly radical front of organized labor. Additionally, acting within the doctrine of flex flexible capacity, SCI provided a space in which mariners could be housed and prepared for service as an essential arm of the U.S. national security apparatus. SCI's auxiliary relationship to U.S. national security was made explicit when the U.S. entered World War II, and SCI was called upon to serve as an official training and reserve station for the nation's rapidly expanding merchant marine. The fact that President Franklin uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt had served on SCI's Board of Managers since 1907, when he was Assistant Secretary of the Navy, only strengthened the con connections between 25 South Street and the U.S. military. The economic and geopolitical roots of SCI's role in providing for the health and wellness of merchant seamen began much earlier than the tumultuous 1930s. By the end of the 19th century, SCI had added education to its services. The notion that civilians should receive formal basic medical training had been adopted broadly in the 1870s, and SCI had aggressively sought to teach first aid to sailors since about 1910. The goal was to ensure that all officers had enough training to provide on-the-spot care and assist the ship's doctor. The Institute had struggled and ultimately succeeded in ensuring that all ships had a medical chest aboard as required. Getting doctors aboard cargo ships was a harder sell. In 1921, more than 75 percent of ships at sea had no doctor aboard, but more than 80 percent did have radios. During World War I, the education programs housed in the top floors at 25 South Street expanded significantly with the increased need for seafarers as they were called into the war effort. SCI's navigation school added to the first aid training such topics as knot tying, navigation, lifeboat handling, and semaphore. SCI credits Captain Robert Huntington, principal of SCI's navigation, marine engineering, and radio school with the idea of connecting ships at sea with doctors on land via radio. Radio telegraphy was an attractive addition to SCI's education offerings, but required substantial financing in, to acquire the necessary equipment and power the signal. 
A gift of $5,000 from steel magnate Henry A. Laughlin fitted out a small room in 25 South Street's tower with all the equipment required to produce a radio telegraphic signal and receive transmissions. In 1920, SCI launched what arguably remains to this day its most innovative and influential program, a radio service that connected doctors on land to ships at sea. This service was so successful that it was soon adopted by the federal government in cooperation with the Radio Corporation of America and similar operations spraying up around the world. Maritime Telemedical Assistance Services, or TMAS, throughout Europe and North America trace their roots to this project. Radio telegraphy, which transmits beep tones rather than articulated sounds or speech, was first demonstrated in 1901. And the following two decades, radio exploded in application. The Wireless Ship Act of 1910 required all ships carrying more than 50 passengers, more than 200 miles off the coast, to carry radio equipment with a range of 100 miles. The Radio Act of 1912 required all seafaring vessels to maintain 24-hour radio watch. Under these circumstances, SCI's radio medical service seems both innovative and inevitable. Henry A. Laughlin's check for SCI's radio equipment, viewable on a lantern slide within uh, SCI's archives, has a date of December 1920. But SCI applied for a radio license when the U.S. government initially made them available. The first radio station license in America was issued on October 27, 1920. One week later, SCI received license number 176. The service was assigned the call letters KDKF, and this call sign was given priority over every other call except SOS. If a ship couldn't reach KDKF directly, it could reach out to a ship located closer to New York in case that ship had a doctor on board. If it didn't, it could pass the message on to additional ships as necessary until a chain of radio operators had connected the ship, the ship in need of medical attention to either a doctor on board another ship or the doctor on call through KDKF. SCI provided the service free of charge to ships regardless of nationality. Initially, KDKF's license only allowed for it to operate from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., which is when the SCI's doctor was on duty in the clinic. In short order, the Hudson Street Hospital, located about 1.3 miles north of 25 South Street, offered to have a doctor available to SCI by phone at any hour, and SCI's license was expanded to 24-hour broadcasting in April 1921, with service beginning in May of that same year. By 1922, KDKF radio operators were contacting doctors at the Public Health Service Hospital number 70 on the other side of the harbor at Staten Island for responses to medical and surgical requests. KDKF's success relied not only on connecting doctors with ship's crews, it also required those crews to have training to properly implement that advice. SEI required young officers enrolled at its Navigation and Marine Engineering School to learn how to care for the sick and wounded before receiving their certificate. SCI augmented the radio service with its Manual on Ship Sanitation and First Aid for Merchant Seamen, first published in 1922, to provide much needed medical resources for merchant ships. Devoted to the care of the ship and self, SCI's manual served to, uh, quote, meet one of the greatest humanitarian needs on board our merchant vessels, unquote, with a quick reference for medical and surgical conditions risked at sea, as well as directions for disease treatment. KDKF contributed to SCI's education work in other ways as well, because the radio equipment gave sailors the opportunity to learn radio operation. However, SCI's involvement with radio medicine was short-lived. By 1922, the Radio Corporation of America had offered to take over and expand the service, coordinating its operation with the U.S. government. The signal moved from 25 South Street to a tower at Bush Terminal in Brooklyn, and by March 1922, KDKF was offline. By 1923, as reports reached 25 South Street of new telemedical services in Norway and Sweden, SCI declared its intention to preserve the KDKF radio equipment, which was no longer in use. 25 South Street was demolished in 1967, and it's unknown what became of that equipment. But radio medicine remains a vital service to ships at sea. Today's maritime telemedical assistance service organizations continue the work started with KDKF. In fall of 2020, the International Center of Medical Radio Communications, an Italian organization, hosted a roundtable held virtually in keeping with the theme and the times, commemorating 100 years of radio slash telemedical assistance at sea. 
with presentations on the modern applications that trace their roots to KDKF. These applications use all current groundbreaking technologies with digital databases accessible via satellite to reduce the isolation that heightens the risks of seafaring. In the intervening century, SCI has built on its success in improving medical conditions at sea by addressing mental health concerns that are unique to seafarers. SCI has led the effort to understand the effects of piracy on seafarers, publishing guidelines on post-piracy care for seafarers. The Institute conducted shore leave studies in order to study seafarers' access to resources and services off ship in U.S. ports, and has most recently met the challenges posed by COVID-19 related restrictions to mobility in port. And maritime ministry organizations on an international level have conducted information needs assessment studies to gauge seafarers' priorities in combating the effects of isolation at sea through communication technologies. Clearly, SCI's early health and wellness initiatives, marked by the innovative extension of services to the high seas through emerging radio technologies more than a century ago, continue on through to present day. Whereas this paper has attempted to situate such initiatives within their historical context during the late 19th and uh, first half of the 20th centuries, within the naval and ge geopolitical theory of flexible capacity, current health initiatives involving a merchant maritime fleet and labor force that is increasingly foreign in both flag and crew might be more closely linked to motivations rooted in an ever expanding global economy dependent on maritime shipping. With these historical and current contexts in mind, we look forward to further research into moments of innovation and influence, such as the Siemens Church Institute's KDKF radio medical station. And here is our contact information. Um, both at Siemens Church and Queens College. And just for reference, the images that are in our slide deck are all taken from the Siemens Church Institute Digital Archives. I've posted the UR URL here, or you can just simply uh, search for Siemens Church Institute Digital Archives to access those photos and about 12,000 additional digital documents, uh, scrapbooks, oral histories, census data, and much, much more. Um, with that, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you both for the that fascinating uh, presentation, and we will have some questions and discussions a little later on. But I think uh, now we're we're going on our third presentation by Dr. Irving B. Rosen. There you see him right there in the middle of the screen. Dr. Rosen was educated elementary and secondary education in the Toronto public school system, graduated from the University of Toronto Medical School, subsequently trained in general surgery in Toronto and the Memorial Center for Cancer, New York City. He was in active surgical practice from 1961 to 2000. 13 and is presently still a professor of surgery at the University of Toronto. Uh, he is active in a number of interesting organizations, the Toronto Medical History Club and the Canadian Society for the History of Medicine. Uh, he has also presented medical history topics to the medical history section of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons at the time of their annual meeting. And uh, so I would like to present Dr. Irving Rosen, who's, who's slave ship surgeons, an unrecognized factor in the abolition of slavery. Dr. Rosen. Um, uh, at, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I appreciate of inclusion in the McMullen Symposium and thank you for his assistance. Naval medicine, uh, uh, heroic battle scenes. Uh, but ship surgeons uh, serve to show effects uh, by naval docks. Despicable slavery has history. Most use out of Egyptian servitude. Slavery was a way of life in ancient Greece and Rome, tolerated by all of these. The founding fathers of the American Republic 
slave owners. Jefferson's lofty idealizations were not extended to slaves. For long and profound intimacy, the African had of his deceased wife. In the 14th Henry of Portugal brought African slaves to Europe, although African traders had dealt previously with Arab buyers. The first Englishman uh, to effect the sale of African slaves to the Western Hemisphere was piratical John Hawkins in 1562, commanded to appear before Queen Elizabeth I for reprimand she became his partner instead after hearing about his venture and the financial results. In, in 1672, the Royal African Company was formed with a monopoly access to the African West Coast, which expired by about 7, 1700 when private traders became involved, making England a major, major trading nation amongst European nations who were all involved in this. It lasted 300 years until the mid 1800s and was paralleled by a progressive improvement in human life, which was capped off really by the Industrial Revolution in the late 1700s. It started with the African trader who enriched himself by kidnapping Africans or waging a war on a neighboring tribe to capture captives, prisoners who were then lined up, secured by a neck brace, and marched to the coast to, uh, to meet the incoming sailing vessels for their purchase. This was called a coffle. The march might take a month or more, and these people might be sold to other African traders en route. At the coast, they might be interred in a castle-like building awaiting a slave ship's arrival. And 60 of these have survived since that time until currently and in being transformed to institutional dwellings of note. Before they're purchased by the slave ship captain, they're inspected and rejected if they show any abnormalities, such as a hernia, gross, falling breasts, or deformities. Those accepted are then transported with bound hands by canoe to the slave ship, having already been branded with an identifying mark. The men were shackled while the women were not, but were liable for sexual abuse by the ship's crew. The men were compelled to go down below where they were fitted into the ship's hull as tightly as possible to permit a successful as possible economic outcome. The Africans rejected for purchase by the ship's captain were subject to arbitrary action by the African handler such as decapitation or being shoved overboard for drowning or a shark attack. Slave ships were of varying types and they could even having acquired as some Africans could stay in harbor until their quota was reached or the ship might strike off for another site to acquire other Africans. But one set, the sailing ship headed for the Western hemisphere in particularly its Southern section where a plantation economy prevailed with the harvesting of cotton, sugar, of course, tobacco and coffee. The trip might take months and a significant mortality affected slaves as well as crew, even up to 30 to 50% of the slave group. Once landed, the slaves were groomed for sale for enhanced saleability. And the sale of the slaves then took place as he underwent still another inspection by buyers but once purchased, most slaves could look forward to nothing but a life of unending fieldwork servitude, experiencing cruel punishment on occasion, accepting household slaves whose work was less demanding. Commerce prevailed here by exporting manufactured goods from Europe to Africa to be used as barter for Africans who are then transported to America to be sold as slaves. And from where molasses, sugar, rum, coffee, cotton, tobacco could be transported for European sale. This was the mighty Atlantic triangular trade, which powered a significant global economy, affecting all occupations and contributing to the fortunes of many, many still prominent families like the American Roosevelt's and the English 
Gladstones, as well as big businesses like Bank of America, Aetna, J.P. Morgan Chase. If slavery was despicable, the Atlantic trade was horrible. Bristol and Liverpool became mighty slave ship ports, and British ships between 1790 and 1800 carried 400,000 slaves to the New World. The ship's captain was integral for the financial success of this venture, which was really a business invest investment by land-based entrepreneurs. One idealized effective captain was John Newton, an experienced, economically successful, affluent slaver in the 1700s, who eventually quit everything to become a minister, an abolitionist, and he wrote the hymn, Amazing Grace. Slaves were unhappy, rebellious, whose well-being had to be assured despite their onboard living situation. The sea voyage could be lengthy, the weather capricious, crew recruitment a problem, available buyers unpredictable. The slave ship captain had absolute responsibility for making a profit and overcoming all the problems. And this included flogging for punishment, even the crew as he saw fit. People of conscience and humaneness, particularly, but not just Quakers, became aware of the ugly aspects of slave trading. In 1787, a committee of nine Quakers, three evangelical Anglicans met in a London print shop to form the Society for the Abolition of the Slave Trade. Symbolized by this figure, set in porcelain by abolitionist Wedgwood. And uh, the committee included particularly Thomas Clarkson, he was the son of an Anglican clergyman and had won the prize at Cambridge University for an essay on slavery, which made him a confirmed abolitionist for life. The committee also allied itself with William Wilberforce, Anglican. And he was a parliamentarian and he enjoyed the prime minister's support and he was indefatigable and persistent. Thomas Clarkson devoted his life to the anti-slavery campaign emerging as the committee's best known representative. He toured the country side, which was no mean feat since it was by horseback, extolling the case for abolition by collecting slave shackles and examples of torture equipment that really advanced his cause, as well as by getting testimonies from anti-slavery anti campaign from sailors, sea captains, but particularly slave ship surgeons or doctors they are really synonymous. Slave ship surgeons had been employed irregularly who earned uh, one half of the captain's wage and were accorded a slave for personal sale. They functioned when medical education and achievement were just in development. The medical armamentarian included, and we just heard some talks in this regard, about included Jenner smallpox vaccination and citrus cure for scurvy, and cinchona bark for treatment of malaria. But many other pharmaceuticals were available that had an archaic appearance, but still enjoy current use. Medical progress took off in the late 19th century. Slave ship doctors were involved in selecting slaves, grooming them for sale, attending to their wounds, attending them at particularly for dysentery or flux, any kind of disease, tropical ailments such as guinea worms, yaws, and isolating sick slaves. In 1788, abolitionist parliamentarian Lord Dolben and some colleagues inspected a slave ship docked in the Thames River. Yeah, right in the Thames River. They had been appalled by the recent Zong slave ship case where Africans were questionably thrown overboard and the ship's owner attempted to collect unsuccessfully insurance benefits. Dolbert's ship inspection revealed such marked crowding that the Dolbin's Act was um, conceived, David, um, and passed in Parliament, decreeing compulsory presence of slave ship doctors, keeping law books, as well as limiting the number of slaves carried according to the ship's tonnage 
with penalties for the act's violation. The uh, the doctor's presence, uh, this pro slavers reflex objections resulted in improved African survival, which the doctors were compensated for. Thomas Clarkson, leading the abolitionist campaign always, acquired testimonies from doctors Ramsey, Arnold, Trotter, Edinger, Stellenbosch, Bowes, who using their logbooks could deliver credible witness of slave management, including their brutalization, beatings, degradation when it occurred. He particularly sensed a great achievement in becoming acquainted with Dr. Alexander Falconbridge during a fact-finding mission in Liverpool. Falconbridge dominates the Google reference list of slave ship searches. In Liverpool, Falconbridge carried a gun, became Clarkson's bodyguard, since Clarkson risked life and bodily harm during his inquiries. Falconbridge, born in Bristol in 1760, attended Bristol Infirmary at age 19 for one year, which qualified him to become a slave ship doctor. In the next seven years, he worked on four different slave ships, and then he left the employment out of disgust with slavery. He worked it with a doctor for a year when he met Clarkson, who was thrilled because Falconbridge was willing to give public testimony. And as a result, Dr. Falconbridge underwent four days of parliamentary inquiry and questioning. And in the, in the uh, parliamentary uh, examination, he described his observations and thoughts, and I'm going to quote this his testimony only in small, small part. Quote, the men brought on board are immediately fastened together uh, with riveted on their legs and handcuffs. They're still close as to being able to lie only on their sides. The exclusion, the hardships suffered by the Negroes are scarcely to be conceived. The exclusion of uh, fresh air is intolerable. Buckets are placed for recourse. Those placed at a distance um, uh, those placed at a distance rumble over con companions being shackled and productive of continual quarrels. They may desist from the attempt and ease themselves as they lie, which becomes a source for boils, making them more uncomfortable. The floor of their, of their quarters are covered with um, blood and mucus and like a slaughterhouse. It's intolerably hot. Negroes refusing sustenance have coals of fire placed near their lips or molten lead. Sick Negroes are isolated and lie on bare planks where their skin and even flesh are rubbed off. If plasters are applied, they're soon displaced. Insurrections are frequent, causing much bloodshed. Various deceptions are used in the disposal, that's to say, sale of six slaves by stuffing up their anus with oakum, causing excruciating pain. The full testimony was subsequently um, issued as a popular pamphlet and still is in publication, obtainable through Amazon. During the American Revolutionary War, the British promised slaves their freedom if they would fight with the British. 20,000 such slaves, relatively small number, took up the British offer. And following the war's conclusion, these liberated slaves migrated to the Caribbean, England, or Sierra Leone, an African enclave deliberately purchased by the British to accommodate freed slaves. 3,000 free, free, uh, freed slaves were transported to Nova Scotia in 1783, which also accommodated 20,000 white British loyalists. The situation in Nova Scotia was not ideal. The territory, terrain rather, largely unsettled, required pioneering cultivation, and the Africans felt unfairly treated compared to their former white masters. John Clarkson, a lieutenant in the Royal Navy, like his older brother, Thomas Clarkson, had developed strong, strong anti-slavery feelings after seeing Caribbean slave treatment during his naval posting there. 
the abolitionists commissioned to deliver free slaves from Nova Scotia to Sierra Leone. With great kindness and care, he shepherded 1,500 people back to Africa in 1788, overcoming severe storms at sea and became the colony's first governor. Falconbridge, on his part, had married Anna Marie Horwood in 1789 and was hired to be the chief administrator or agent at Sierra Leone by the abolitionists who formed a company in the hope of promoting a productive colony populated chiefly by freed slaves. Idealized wishes became confronted with real problems in agriculture, climate, and housing. Falconbridge and his part struggled with his new responsibilities and now began showing evidence of marked alcoholism and his wife avoided his company, seeking others at nearby Vance Island, a well-recognized, in the Sierra Leone River, a well-recognized slave trading site that also supplied slave ships with various goods and now is an overgrown relic of yesteryear. John Clarkson and Falconbridge acrimoniously competed for leadership, leadership, which led to their mutual dismissal by the abolitionists, followed by Falconbridge's death at Freetown, Sierra Leone, at age 32 in 1792. His wife, Maria, promptly remarried, became a pro-slavery advocate, and departed for England, where she wrote uh, travel books about her African stay. Despite these adverse events, the abolitionist society persisted in their activities with increasing effectiveness. The doctor's statements had made an impact, but, and more and more of society's opinion came out against slavery. This was further abetted by the activity of various anti-slavery women's groups, Methodist re reaction and anti-slavery preaching, organized sugar boycotts, publication by Thomas Clarkson of a great anti-slavery book that became popular reading, agitation by freed slaves and latterly slave rebellions and technological improvements in, uh, in harvesting, all of which seriously undermined the resistance put up by pro-slavery partisans. William Wilberforce, a public-spirited, moralistic person introduced an abolition bill in Parliament in 1789. It took 50 years of continuous campaigning by all um, um, before he was able to succeed in passing legislation for the abolition of slavery in graduated stages in the British Empire in 1833 with 20 million pounds compensation for slave owners, nothing for the freed slaves. As a Canadian, I'm proud to know that General John Grave Symbol, when he was appointed governor of Canada, outlawed, banned slavery in Canada in 1793. Ironically, as a British general, he was then assigned to Haiti to lead British troops opposing the only successful slave rebellion led by two soft mature. In 1840, a worldwide anti-slavery convention was held in England with a substantial American delegation, but with the exclusion of women who were strong anti-slavery advocates. Thomas Clarkson addressed the gathering, condemning slavery still in existence and calling strongly for a slavery-free world which did transpire, but only after 25 years and after a bloody civil war. While the situations are not similar, the contribution of slave ship surgeons can be better appreciated if you note their, con their conduct in contrast to the doctors in Nazi Germany who played a compliant, uncritical, willing part in the organized, industrialized murder of Nazi slaves. Slave ship surgeons, not all, but many, went against vested interests, their own financial well-being, even wide societal acceptability to provide loud, effective, critical witness to an iniquitous practice tolerated too long by society. Thank you.
Discussion. Well, let me introduce Paula uh, Schiapacase, who is going to be the commentator. Uh, Paula is currently the adjunct professor, undergraduate anthropology program, Department of Sociology and Anthropology, University of Puerto Rico. Uh, trained uh, in New York, Syracuse University, received her PhD in anthropology, and subsequent uh, to that, a master's in museum studies, also from Syracuse University. She is engaged in research that addresses 16th to early 20th century Caribbean archaeology, and she teaches undergraduate and graduate courses in archaeology and anthropology. So, Dr. Schiappa Kase. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. I want to start by thanking our hosts at the Naval Academy, uh, our three panelists for the wonderful presentations, and of course, the Society for the History of Navy Medicine. Um, the role of commentator is um, it's, it's very um, rewarding uh, in terms of being able to critically read and listen to the read to the, the papers and listen to the presentations and i would like to um start i'm going to follow the order of presentations and just give some brief commentaries um on, and highlight uh things that i believe are extremely interesting uh, to to the people who are joining us today and thanks to those who are joining us um through the platform and those who are um in person um, Gerald Stock's research um, has uh, very efficiently outlined the history of the disease uh, of scurvy with specific details on the causes and treatments. Scurvy, to many of us, to many researchers, is known as a vitamin C deficiency caused disease that has wreaked havoc. Um, particularly relevant to the Americas is the presence of the disease, as he mentioned, in the earliest Spanish settlement of La Isabela, the first Spanish um, thought out um, settlement. And therefore, it allows us to trace and delineate the impact scurvy had in the New World. Basically, in the colonization, the commercial activities, and the continuity and the continuity of settlements and how successful they were in maintaining these sites. The signs and, sy and symptoms as, as described in, in the primary sources that um, he consulted make it apparent that it would have been very easy to misdiagnose. Um, and, and this uh, has been a recurrent theme uh, throughout his presentation. The variety of treatments in a time when no scientific testing was available points to the ways in which various populations try to deal with the disease. Um, trial and error uh, could be the, the main theme of, of, those, um, of those tests that, that were being done, those experiments. Uh, those experiments and trials uh, did produce some positive results, yet were not followed up. And I think that it's something um, that comes out in, in, in his presentation when he talks about the ad admiralty's lack of action. And I'm quoting him, um, beyond politics, bureaucracy, and conflicting egos, right? So it had been pointed out that the use of lemon juice or citrus fruits could have been indeed um, be employed as a possible remedy. In the case of the, the citrus fruits, what, what really strikes me as, as not odd, but surprises me, is the fact that um, the price has affected the availability and how often people's experiences, as he um, mentioned uh, with Captain Cook, uh, and their testimonials gain more relevance and trumped um, evidence that was there. Nevertheless, um, as he mentions, um, the toll of the Georgian Navy on the Georgian Navy um, hasn't been fully addressed. Uh, this needs to be further studied. And also, I, I would suggest, and, and I would love to read more about 
what were other causes or what are other explanations given for the lack of action from the Admiralty? Uh, I think that should that should be expanded, um, as well as maybe independent actions that were taken by other doctors as well as seamen based on the experiences and based on word of mouth. The SCI KDKF um, presentation um, to me was very uh, refreshing because it made me think of how is, I mean, we, we don't often think about a time where tele telemedical services were not part of the daily life on maritime activities prior to the 20th century, right? So delineating again or tracing the history of, of the services that were provided beyond you know, the establishment of, of the KDKF and um, medical attention, but also the concern about making first aid education available uh, to people, as well as a navigation school, radio telegraphy. And I would like to highlight that the operation details um, actually give us a glimpse into aspects of social life, right? So what was considered important at the time and which improvements were needed as seen by the people who were um, experiencing um, those uh, needs. The role of doctors on board, I think it's, it's something that it's also connected um, throughout the three presentations. And, and in this case, again, we do know that there were doctors on board, but um, what about other situations where either doctors were not on board or doctors were not properly trained or did not have you know, the knowledge um, to deal with certain situations? So this brings us to contemplate and think about uh, what the impacts of being able to communicate with, um, with the seamen and also give them medical um, directions as to how to deal with different situations. The manual on ship sanitation and, and first aid for merchant seamen, and now I'm quoting, um, which was, uh, as I mentioned, published in 1922, allows us also to understand what the evolution of medical treatment was. Particularly interesting to me is um, the part of the presentation when they mentioned that the SCI um, was concerned, right, uh, about mental health and the effects of isolation. And specifically because when we think about the, the life of, you know, people who are um, involved in maritime trade or involved in the Navy, we often think about the physical illnesses and being able to look at a particular time when mental health and isolation became a concern is also for historians, um, his, historians of medicine, um, historians of Navy medicine, historians of mental, uh, mental health, it will open doors to additional research. So um, I was also thinking uh, throughout the presentation how lovely it will be to see future research that could incorporate similar or concurrent initiatives in other cities um, in the continental US, as well as other countries. Dr. Rosen's uh, presentation um, on the role of um, slave ship surgeons uh, beyond the medical care that they provided on voyages, voyages such as, um, and I'm quoting, selecting enslaved people, grooming them for sale, attending to their wounds and isolating them, also allows us and gives way to think of other uh, potential involvements of these doctors with the um, enslaved uh, populations. And I was um, thinking throughout the presentation what it would have been like for people who were involved um, with human cargoes, as is often uh, referred to in the, in the literature, what it would have been like for these surgeons that were probably seen by the enslaved people as a link 
between the inhumanity of slavery and slavery related activities and a glimpse of humanity in the care that these doctors provided regardless of what their opinion was i mean a doctor is providing medical assistance and there is a humanity involved in that so the personal feelings of, of these surgeons could have easily uh, presented a dichotomy for those who supported slavery but it was also a turning point for those who were pro-abolitionist or pro-abolition having experienced the activities of the atlantic triangular trade uh, in this case firsthand and the treatment of slave people both um, on board at auctions and sales gave these doctors the opportunity to play an important role in what was at the time um, a very strong discussion uh, within our society and it also gave them the opportunity to share through their testimonials what that triangular trade was really like we often hear about court cases and we can read newspapers that are obviously leaning towards slavery and why slavery should have been you know kept but i think this specific line of information the doctors who were treating the enslaved people would have been that glimpse again of humanity that was needed in that society to understand what's exactly what was exactly happening i would suggest that future research could focus on particular log books uh, kept by these doctors as it was mentioned by dr rosen we could also look at the treatments that were available on board and on ports the medical instruments that were employed and the influence that all of these doctors played on the potential improvements uh, on the care of enslaved people it's it, it struck me as odd right that um, these doctors were rewarded um, if they were able to increase on board survival rates so that could easily be turned into a case study at, at looking uh, those at those arrival rates and specifically which treatments were employed by those doctors and it could be that we will learn more about treatments or homeopathic ways that some uh, diseases or ailments were treated knowledge from Africa knowledge that was brought from Europe and of course um, the exchange of those ideas and that knowledge I think that also the the role of the doctors both in Nova Scotia and Sierra Leone um, who cared for the freed people should be expanded and there is um, there is a body of literature that can support this to summarize uh, my my comments or my my intervention here I, I would like to congratulate um, all the researchers for first of all allowing us to learn more about topics that are not usually addressed uh, for the amount of detail and the care shown when dealing with the, both the primary and the secondary sources. And with that, I would like to then turn over to the, have enough, you know, I would like to stop now so we have enough time for the Q&A. So thank you all. Thank you very much, Dr. Scapacase. Uh, Yes, indeed, we have learned a lot today from all three of our speakers and um, a lot of new information. So I appreciate very much your commentary and uh, for uh, uh, contributing to our program. We do have a little time here for questions and uh, of any of the speakers, virtually or yes, um, we have. Tom, and first of all, let me tell, let me say that this is the fellow who put this all together. Tom Schneider deserves an awful lot of uh, thanks from us all. 
as the executive director of our society. Thank you, Tom. Now that you have a question. Thank you, Admiral. No, a, a, a comment. First of all, thanks again to our speakers and our commentator. Um, this is a class act, and I'm really proud of you all. Thank you. I don't have a question. I have a comment. I Googled KDFK, I'm sorry, KD, K, KDKF, to see if that call letter still exists. And it does. It's an ABC television station in Klamath Falls, Oregon. I bet you they have no idea where <laughs> the, the origin of their call letters. My comment. Thanks a lot. Congratulations again. <laughs> you had a question. Yeah, I do. Um, for Gerald, um, yeah, can, yeah. You, can you tell us? Um, I, I have two questions, really, so I want to understand in which way. Sure. Um, can, is there any kind of comparison that you've done, A, with like the merchant service? You know, are they doing anything more innovative than the Royal Navy is? I mean, they're sending out you know, East Indiamen uh, and obviously on very long voyages as well. Right. What are they doing that the Admiralty isn't doing? Or are they doing the exact same thing? Uh, that's a good question, and I haven't gotten so much into the mercantile aspect of it. Uh, John Woodall, in the early 17th century, though he was a naval surgeon, worked for the East India Company, and he's the one that, for, as a business venture, strongly promoted the use of citrus fruits going to the East Indies. So on the mercantile side, uh, they may have been a little bit more advanced at that time. It also varied from nation to nation. Uh, the French and Spanish in particular were not very good at dealing with scurvy, uh, where the Dutch were a little more advanced as for that island that they established, for instance, with the citrus fruits. But the overall, I can't say that I have delved into it that much. I would just give you an educated guess, but I can't back that up with any research. Well, cool. and, and answered my first question, you answered my second. So I was going to ask <laughs> you what the other European powers were doing. <laughs> Um, I know the French typically were a lot dirtier <laughs> in their uh, shipboard hygiene, and obviously that's yes. a reflection on <laughs> uh, yeah. overall health. But in combating, you know, just the nutritional value of of foods, I you know I, I think that they probably were. I agree that they're probably lacking. Yeah, a lot of cheese. A lot of cheese. <laughs> further, further questions. Mm -hmm. I have one comment also for Dr. Stoke. Uh, you mentioned that scurvy was a problem as late as the Scott expedition? Yes. When they found the bodies of Scott and his uh, colleagues, uh, they were suffering terribly from scurvy and they had made adequate provisions and they never uh, reached their stockpiles. They died before then, but they were, this was 1905, I believe, suffering horribly from scurvy. And their physician to that expedition said that it was a lack of sunlight and the excess work and the cold environment that caused scurvy. So again, they had no clue. Wow. No clue. That's really surprising. Yeah, it is. It was 1912. Something, yeah, I can't remember the exact date, but it was, yes. Oh, okay. Joe, can you say hi to Tom and the 1805 club member? Sure. Hi, Tom. <laughs> did you hear that? No, I don't think so. There's, yes, there you did. <laughs> Thank you all. Really Thank you. Thanks for hanging in there. <laughs> Thank you very much, and we, we've made it to our a lot of time. So thank you all. Ooh, Thanks all the right. panelists, and everyone have a good day. Thank you. Yes. Congratulations again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks, take care. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Rosen. Dr.